Technology is advancing at a rapid pace. With breakthrough innovations in AI and automation being churned out by the year and month, it may be appropriate to describe the period we're living through as something of a new industrial revolution. And that's not a platitude, just consider the raw facts. Some measures have suggested AI's ability to compute has been doubling every half year since at least 2010, four times the pace proposed by observations like Moore's Law. Since then, the quantity of industrial robots being used across the world has more than quadrupled. With the exception of agriculture, approximately 40% of jobs across all sectors have been at least partially automated, including healthcare, legal, and manufacturing fields. And despite some suggestions that AI is nearing a plateau, these predictions have been put off year after year after year, with it now appearing that no plateau is in sight. On the contrary, the pace of AI innovation and growth is expected to take off exponentially once AI itself begins contributing significantly to its own improvement, which many believe will occur within just a few years. And once that happens, development could be expected to skyrocket to heights never before imagined. Hand in hand with AI development, one could expect tremendous strides in automated production, economic growth, and much more. In an optimistic future in which we're able to maintain dominance over AI as a tool, AI in this form would act as a force multiplier. One single human with AI and automated tools at his disposal doing 100, 1000, even 10,000 times the labor that a human could have done in years prior. Suddenly it makes no difference how big your population is, what matters is how many people can utilize these AI tools to maximum efficiency. Production is no longer a matter of raw manpower, production's a matter of how much computing power you have, and computing power takes energy. As countries become more automated, making greater use of AI technology, it's going to become essential to utilize greater energy sources. The simple fact is this. Conventional alternative energies like solar, air, and hydro energy are insufficient to power the needs of today. Fossil fuels, which are much more powerful, still struggle to meet even today's needs, let alone those projected in the future. We've all heard for decades by this point of the risk of a fuel shortage, the exhausting of carbon fuel sources. Ideas of war over the last drops of oil, while distant they may be, still crop up in discussion here and there. And of course is the matter of the environment. Whatever your political orientation, it's difficult to ignore that a great segment of the population desires a move away from fossil fuels to cleaner alternatives, and there is in fact a clean alternative which is far more powerful than fossil fuels, one which, when you compare it to fossil fuels, is equivalent to 2 million times its weight in coal or gasoline. I'm speaking, of course, of nuclear power. Believe it or not, this is a popular option catching on in both right-wing and left-wing circles. It's not a matter of political disagreement at this point as much as it is a generational disagreement. We see with increasing frequency support and advocacy for nuclear as a safe, sustainable, and low-carbon emission source of energy from both young right-wingers and young left-wingers. Even US President Donald Trump in the last days of May signed four executive orders aimed at further nuclear development through fast-tracking licensing, restructuring the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, giving greater power to the Department of Energy, building a nuclear-trained workforce, developing better means of fuel recycling, and prioritizing the use of nuclear power for AI and military facilities. Naturally, there is still skepticism, largely among older populations who grew up in the shadow of nuclear scare and hearing of disasters like Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and the even more recent Fukushima, not to mention the legacy of activists who entangled nuclear power with fears of nuclear war. With the exception of Fukushima, whose meltdown was caused by a remarkably severe natural disaster, which frankly should have been accounted for given the region's susceptibility to floods and tsunamis, Chernobyl and Three Mile Island's meltdowns were largely the cause of human error and negligent mistakes which today, thanks to redundancies and additional safety measures, would be nearly impossible to repeat unless regulations were dropped to reckless levels. If we were to say triple the number of nuclear reactors in, let's just suppose, the United States for instance, we'd be able to power every single home in the US with nuclear-made electricity and then some. We'd actually be making enough energy to power twice the number of homes that currently exist. Practically speaking, that's basically limitless energy for a country like the US. So what could we do with all that surplus power? Hello audience, Mr. Z here with another video for you. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We have videos like this on history and politics every week, so be sure to subscribe and stay tuned for more. All news around nuclear and AI technology is constantly being covered in multiple different ways. Some are fearful of the damage that it may cause, while others are hopeful for how it will improve their lives. But what I keep seeing are misleading headlines and stories about AI and nuclear energy. That's why I like to use Ground News and want to thank them for sponsoring this video and for being a reliable tool in better understanding the various angles of news stories that crop up every day. It's the only app and website that aggregates over 50,000 news sources from all over the world and puts it into one place. By comparing various headlines showing a side-by-side -side view of how the same story is framed and highlighting the bias and factuality of various news sources, Ground News makes navigating the media landscape all the more comfortable. 
Take, for example, Meta's new deal with Constellation Energy. When I look at this story through Ground News, I see that it's being covered by over 290 sources. There is a fair split between the left and the right, and over 50% coverage from the center. What's best is that this news story has an over 92% factuality rating, which means that I can trust a lot of these sources, and if you sign up now, you'll really make the most of Ground News by getting unlimited access at 40% off through Vantage Plan. This exclusive discount is only available through my link ground.news slash MrZ, so don't miss out. You can also scan the QR code on the screen or click the link in the description. Now, nuclear power isn't without its hang-ups. It's probably the most time-consuming and expensive to set up, taking at least a couple years to safely build a nuclear plant and costing around five times the initial investment. However, the long-term gains easily outweigh that. We're talking about something significantly more powerful than even fossil fuels, and insofar as its lifespan, nuclear plants can last for decades. Some even suggesting a well-maintained plant can remain operational for over a century. The only thing comparable is hydroelectric dams, which have only a fraction of the output nuclear has. Nuclear plants also open the door to job creation, high-paying jobs which further make the initial investment all the more worthwhile. A lot of that cost is also tied up in the licensing process, which Trump's deregulation aims to simplify, though hopefully not at the cost of essential security and safety measures. It's natural to be concerned with the risk of nuclear power, but a realistic look at the situation shows that nuclear is nowhere near as dangerous as many believe it to be with modern technology. Radiation leakage, for instance, is virtually impossible. Modern reactors are extra fortified specifically to prevent radiation from escaping. What about mutation through proximity? There's no credible research that suggests proximity to reactors leads to increased risk of genetic mutation or illness, and when properly shielded you could stand right next to a reactor for days on end, like in the case of a nuclear submarine, and not be irradiated at all. What about contamination through dumping of nuclear waste? Nuclear plants produce relatively little waste which is very easily and safely stored, often on site. With Trump's proposed efforts to discover practical ways of recycling waste into additional fuel, the existence of this material ceases to be even the inconvenience that it is now. And of course, there's the fear of terror attacks on nuclear plants. It's a given that these facilities should be well protected, and they are. But even if we assume someone was to sneak in and try to turn it or the nuclear material into a bomb, it's a myth that nuclear reactors can explode like nuclear bombs do. The quality of the fuel is very different. Even if someone were to, say, crash a plane into the reactor, it wouldn't cause a nuclear explosion. The dome surrounding the nuclear core is likely to survive anything short of a bunker buster or a nuclear warhead. And say you had an instance of sabotage. Redundancies and fail-safes would likely be able to capture any major disaster before it happens. Nuclear is remarkably safe, especially when we consider a lot of the fear-mongering that surrounds it. And let's not pretend that other energy systems are perfectly safe either, both for us or the environment. Hydroelectric dams can collapse and often disrupt ecosystems, oil rigs can cause catastrophic spills that are toxic to wildlife and people, not to mention how dangerous working on an oil rig can be. Coal mining carries the risk of mine collapse and releasing toxic gases. There, there was actually a town I traveled through in Pennsylvania that had to be evacuated decades ago because the mines underneath the town caught fire and they're still burning to this day. Drilling for gas or oil can contaminate groundwater and of course gas pipelines can be easily sabotaged. The list just goes on. The reality is this, there has not been one single radiation-related death in the US that can be attributed to a commercial nuclear power plant. There have been some deaths attributable to government experiments and nuclear testing, but never from any of the several plants that currently exist today providing energy to the civilian population, not even from the Three Mile Island disaster. When we consider deaths per terawatt hour, the only energy source which is safer than nuclear is solar, and that comes at the cost of a tremendous amount of power potential. So if nuclear really is so safe and powerful, what exactly can we do with that unlimited power? Hand in hand with fears of fuel shortage is the overall fear of resource shortage, and chief among those is the most vital of those resources for our survival, clean drinking water. At present, about 0.5% of the water in the world is classified as fresh water, and there's about another 2.5% locked up in the ice caps. Now we can purify that water and basically recycle it, that's what we've been doing in the developed world for years now, but even then, water scarcity is rampant, especially in hotter climates like the southern United States, the Mediterranean, and various parts of Latin America. Water scarcity seems almost paradoxical given how much of the planet's surface is occupied by ocean. All that water and not a drop to drink. With nuclear power, that can change. We've had desalination technology of one kind or another for centuries at this point, but it's always been costly and impractical. Innovations in this technology continue making it better and better, but still it demands a great degree of power. 
power which nuclear can supply with ease. Large-scale adoption of nuclear power suddenly makes mass desalination viable, water scarcity solved with the seeming snap of a finger. Now I know this has very important implications for the United States given the water issues faced by California, the growth of Arizona and the strain being placed upon its fragile infrastructure, and the inevitable water crisis Texas will face in the near future. But if what some have suggested is true, desalination may prove vital to preventing a major migrant crisis in the not too distant future. Much like in the case of Texas, the aquifers feeding the Middle East are rapidly being depleted much faster than they can be recharged. Worse yet, some of these aquifers cannot be recharged, and once they're gone, they're gone. The growth of the region in recent decades has really put a lot of strain on their resources. If this trend continues with no mitigation, a flood of refugees from this region to more water-rich parts of the world could be expected. However, by creating water surpluses in the developed world, this extra water could be sold to the Middle Eastern countries as a vital resource, much as the Middle East acts as a chief oil exporter today. And of course, in time, this part of the world could develop the means to sustain mass desalination on their own. Desalination doesn't just mean drinking water, but it also means more water for irrigation, agriculture, farming. Development of sufficient pipeline infrastructure from the coasts into places like Utah, Nevada, and Arizona could easily terraform these states into lush green landscapes. The same could go for any arid corner of the globe. Suddenly, agriculture potential takes off, but not just in the traditional sense. Nuclear power creates the potential to revolutionize how we think about agriculture. Imagine, if you will, every single grocery store replaced with an everything farm. Tropical fruits, seasonal crops, exotic vegetables, all grown on site year-round at a fraction of the price, because there's no transportation fee, there's no pesticides, not even any farmers. The concept is called vertical farming, and it proposes bringing agriculture to urban communities, suburban communities, to every community. Through a combination of traditional methods, hydroponics and aeroponics, crops are grown not just horizontally, but vertically, indoors, under controlled conditions which allow for a year-round cultivation, security from pests, and removes the risk of inclement conditions which may harm harvests. Moreover, this is right in everyone's backyard. If you are on the energy grid, you can have a vertical farm, whether in a grocery store or in a skyscraper. This is a relatively new concept with tremendous potential, but it had two major hang-ups for the longest time. Cost and energy. I think you see where I'm going with this. Powering the heating, cooling, lighting, ventilation, and water systems on these farms puts a lot of strain on traditional energy sources, and naturally that comes with a high price tag, but with nuclear, the practice becomes viable, and tackles another key criticism which is the environmental impact created by the energy used to power such a large system. Pair this with innovations in automation, and you essentially have a limitless supply of food in any community with minimal need for human labor and high profit potential following initial investment. Those are two major things that we can do right here on Earth. But let's also think about space. This next point is one in which I'm not very well read, so I reached out to a buddy of mine who's worked in aerospace and runs his own AI company, and he told me about the Demonstration Rocket for Agile Cislunar Operations, or the Draco Project. It was a project which aimed to move away from conventional propulsion to one powered by a nuclear engine. Draco would have broken pre-existing limits on space travel imposed by chemical propulsion by doubling current speeds in long-distance voyages and operated at three times the energy efficiency. You may have noticed I've been speaking of Draco in past tense, and that's because as of May 30th, the project has essentially been cancelled due to Trump's budget cuts, which I had to inform my friend of after doing my own research, much to his disappointment. Even if not as a direct government project, it's quite likely independent parties like SpaceX, Blue Origin, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and the like will capitalize on the potential of nuclear energy as it becomes more practical and a competitive edge. Regardless of what results from Trump's restructuring of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, we could expect nuclear material to become more accessible to independent companies. The question is really just how much government oversight will there be? Is this just going to be expanding upon the traditional government contractor role? Whatever the case, it's quite likely that nuclear propulsion will eventually be put into large-scale use. So does a nuclear engine mean we'll be able to have more regular trips to the moon? Not exactly. With the way a nuclear engine works, it's very useful for long-distance voyages, helpful for a voyage to Mars, and essential if you're going to go beyond that distance, but for the gap between the Earth and the moon, chemical propulsion is probably going to reign supreme unless some alternative launching system is developed. A nuclear engine isn't practical for liftoff, but it can pick up serious speed in the vacuum of space over time in a very energy efficient way. That being said, you're probably still going to need a rocket to blast the ship out of Earth's atmosphere first. It's just not worth it, but 
nuclear still has great applications in space, and that is in the field of fueling stations and potential colonies and celestial bodies. A moon base or a Mars base is almost certainly going to depend on nuclear power to guarantee that the various systems sustaining a livable environment remain up and running in the cold, vast emptiness of space. And that very likely will also include vertical farming and water purification systems. Assuming these colonies also serve a function beyond expanding humanity's reach or simple research, mining is probably going to be the most likely occupation for many of these colonies, which naturally means you're going to need a reliable fuel source to power any mining machinery. A point of concern my aerospace friend raised was that none of Trump's executive orders on the matter of nuclear power in general seemed to loop in the gold standard of nuclear engineering in the country, the Naval Reactor's Office, which my friend described as having a flawless record, a reputation for skill and attention to detail, and is regularly consulted by larger government groups like NASA for direction and support in nuclear engineering. This, along with what seems like a possible blanket deregulation of nuclear power, did raise concerns for both of us, as we recognize that there is a safe and effective way to do this through experienced channels, but at least at the moment, there's no clarity on if greater attention is being paid to expert nuclear advice. The final but perhaps most obvious contribution nuclear gives us is the topic we began with, automation. And what nuclear does here is really scale what we already have, and allow us to do things even better. We brought up how quickly automation has grown in such a short span of time. Now, consider how much more quickly it will be adopted with energy infrastructure to sustain it. It might take a lot of power to run a factory of machines operating 24-7, and though productivity may increase, it might still be cheaper in the short term to just have people do the work. You cut out the high price tag of energy, and suddenly, all that automation becomes all the more viable. The same goes for AI. AI with greater computing power suddenly becomes more viable, more accessible, and its potential balloons into an unfathomable size. The US government recognizes as much, that's why there is this move to power AI facilities with nuclear exclusively. This is perhaps the most speculative part of this video because frankly, and my friend with his AI company reaffirmed this, the possibilities are limitless, and the butterfly effects that come from that just compound on what we could see unfold. AI within a decade, with its servers scaled bigger and bigger, as big as nuclear power can allow, could possibly do everything from develop cures for diseases in minutes, simulate economic and geopolitical policies with incredible accuracy, to operate entire cities autonomously, to churn out new technological innovations by the day. In theory, you'd be able to power a superhuman intelligence, and that's its own video altogether. The inspiration for this video actually came from a script I had partially written a few weeks ago about the direction AI could take. Of course, then Trump comes out with these policies about expanding America's nuclear energy production, and now we have this video here. If you'd like me to flesh out that script that I partially wrote on the bigger topic of AI and where it could go, just let me know in the comments below, as well as your thoughts on the subject. Remember to like the video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe for more. Mr. Z, out.